And I'm going to clock myself. Um, first of all, I want to, of course, celebrate um, and congratulate uh, Remy and Iris um, for being chosen to go to Venice and Benno, who is uh, uh, leading them towards that uh, beautiful moment and this interesting process. So congrats and uh, it's very exciting. Very exciting, very celebratory. Sometimes I also had a moment like it was very depressing <laughs> to hear Miriam speak. So I, uh, not, not because you were speaking, Miriam, of course not. I'm a big fan of yours and your work, but the stuff we're up against, right? If the, the data, uh, someone also mentioned the, the data research, uh, I have actually have a slide on it. Anyway, so, and also we're in the building that is celebrating its 100th birthday this year. The, you, woo, woo, woo. yes, the association Vereniging on Suriname. So who is in this building for the first time? Yeah. Yeah, a lot of you still. Okay, and so who would call themselves a feminist? Oh, hello. Well, let's see what the rest will do after my talk. Um, good. <laughs> um, and so Iris uh, Kensmil uh, specifically asked me to talk about uh, black feminism in the Netherlands, and uh, because that's also what uh, uh, inspires uh, her work. So, and this is obviously a, a, a fave topic of mine. I've talked a lot about it already. Um, and um, so I'm kind of giving a mini lecture, if that's okay with you. Um, and yeah, so that's what I'm going to do. And I have too many slides. Um, and I'm going to talk, my talk will surround around a couple of things that uh, I've did er, in earlier days. One of them being this book called uh, Kaleidoscopic Visions, or yeah, it's not actually in uh, English, but Kaleidoscopic Visions, which was published um, in 2001, uh, which I co-wrote with uh, Gloria Wecker and uh, Maika Botman. And also an article that I wrote um, yeah, a couple of years ago in this uh, historical magazine called Historica. Um, and basically what I want to do a little bit is, um, yeah, why is it that, um, and I'm, I'm going to talk specifically about black fe feminism in the Netherlands, because we're in the Netherlands, we're talking about artists from the Netherlands, it's important to actually acknowledge the presence of such a movement in the Netherlands that was very much alive, very much kicking. Um, and so, but the thing is that that movement has uh, been, become invisible at some point in time. And how does that work? How, how does it become invisible, but also how has it been acknowledged uh, or re-acknowledged again recently? And so these are some of the premises that I would like to put out there. One is that the Dutch feminist movement is definitely not a white movement. Secondly, that, and I use the acronym BMR, but in Dutch we actually say ZMV, which stands for Zwart Migrant Vluchteling, so Black Migrant Refugee. Um, and I will explain later uh, how that came about, but um, BMR feminists, and I guess I'm one of them, centralize intersectionality and have put racism, sexism, the, and the link between the two on the map. Um, and I also, and this is maybe the, the um, stelling or thesis I want to drop today, is that there is a continuation of colonial tropes in today's society. And you can see it being played out um, in the case of Silvana Simons, in the case of Gloria Wecker and others. <coughs> where the black female intellectual is seen as an oxymoron. An oxymoron being someone who doesn't exist, really. Okay, and so I have to invoke her presence. Um, Sojourner Truth, um, who uh, has become very well known <coughs> for her speech, Ain't I a Woman, from um, 1851 at a women's rally in Ohio, Akron, in the USA where she was basically making an intersectional statement. 
So these days, if we talk about intersectionality, people are like, oh my God, what's a difficult word? It's very academic, I don't understand it. No, it came from the grassroots and it came from people like her. And by the way, side note, she was born in um, New York State where uh, she spoke Dutch till she was nine because her first slave owner was a Dutch speaking man. And so in that very important speech, she basically said, said well, I work as hard as any man. Uh, I'm not being treated as any white woman, but am I not still a woman? And so she, that was an, you could say an intersectional in invocation. And I'll return to her. Intersectionality then became, for those of you who don't know the term, then became an academic term uh, coined by Kimberly Crenshaw, a, a law professor in 1989, where she basically tried to work with intersectionality um, because um, she was also going to court um, to prove that black women were discriminated, discriminated against in a particular way. And if you only used gender or if you only used race, you could not point out what, what that really was. But it has become a sort of an analysis uh, that both speaks to positive and negative processes. Positive in the sense that it talks about agency, uh, empowerment, um, identification, but also the negative processes, forms of oppression, racism, sexism, and the like. So I'm now going to take you on a quick time travel. Because it's now a hundred years ago that uh, women got the vote in the Netherlands. Uh, this year is a hundred years. I mean, it's very normal, it's never naturalized, but this is something actually that uh, feminists in the 19th century are fighting for. But this is always also the heyday of colonialism. And um, it was very much uh, intertwined with colonial power structures, which also meant uh, that in Western European countries, and especially uh, also in the Netherlands, feminism wasn't, was alive, but ne not necessarily thought out in, in conjunction with other forms of struggle. And this, liberation struggles, and this, this is important to uh, realize. Well, um, although, if we look at different parts of the colonial Dutch empire, uh, the Dutch East Indies or Suriname, for instance, we had feminists already like Raven Cartini and Sophie Redmond who spoke out, who were feminists, uh, but also always in conjunction with the fact that they were very aware of the fact that they were colon colonized subjects. And so, jumping to the 20th century, we see uh, race, of course, since we now know, thanks to Gloria Wecker, being a very important um, signifier, um, we can say that while in the uh, after World War II, race became sort of uh, missing in action. Eh? We do not do race. This is what uh, we believe to be the, the situation in the Netherlands. Ethnicity becoming more commonplace. Why did we ditch race? The Holocaust is sort of the simplistic answer, but this is how um, it basically worked out. And so difference was uh, understood uh, through other uh, axes of difference, more, uh, for instance, religion. Um, and of course, this notion of pillarization and being a very pillarized society. This was connected very much to this idea of tolerance being a Dutch quality. So we don't do racism, eh? this idea of being in a post-racial society almost. And then this Dutch nation developed into this idea of having, having guiding morals, being having a progressive stance, being very um, uh, invested in this notion of tolerance. And a counterculture coming up in the 60s rooted very much in the student movement, very much also here in Amsterdam. Maybe some of you were part of it, um, but it wasn't necessarily thought out in conjunction again with um, civil, <coughs> sorry, civil rights and an anti-racist movement. But this is exactly the time when um, the second feminist wave, and waves are, are it's ne not necessarily a useful term anymore, but for now, um, 1967, Yoko Smith's 
um, seminal piece uh, on the discontentment of women was sort of the kickoff for a second wave of feminism, which, if I summarize it, uh, was really about the right to self-determination. And it kind of took 16 years before we kind of um, let a, a, a black women's movement come to the rise with an impromptu jump on the stage by Yulia Dalima and her seminal speech that she started with the famous words, we black women. And so this was, again, about the right to self-determination, but it always needs to go in connection with, uh, it always should involve representation. Um, so who were those women uh, that were involved in black feminism? It was mostly uh, post-colonial migrant women, so women from the Dutch East Indies, Moluccans, Papuans, um, the Dutch Caribbean, Suriname, who started a feminist discourse, who already organized themselves in the 60s onwards, but from a feminist perspective more uh, at the late 70s and 80s. A very heterogeneous group coming from different parts of the former empire, uh, different generations, different classes, but one shared issue, which was very clearly the struggle against racism and its link uh, with um, um, its connection to gender from a post-colonial background. At a certain point, this group of black feminists um, became a more diverse group, um, entered uh, um, enter labor migrants, for instance, um, who had um, who took kind of uh, issue with the term black. Hence, this move to um, the term BMR, which um, I would say is an intersectional intervention, where it's an inclusive acronym to uh, basically embrace the diversity of the group, but also the quality of diversity, in a sense. But how did the term black come along? Well, this is Yulia Dalima, um, who did that um, impromptu uh, moment in 1983 during the winter university in, I think it was Nijmegen, um, where she said, when talking about black women, I refer to women from former colonies and all women who are being called foreign, loctonous, not even an English word, but you know what I mean. Non-Western, third world by white people. Um, and interesting fact, she's Moroccan, of Moroccan descent. Moroccan people are not seen as black, don't consider themselves to be black. Nonetheless, um, entering this term of, of political blackness, uh, if you will, as a rallying term uh, um, and as a relational term, a term also of shared solidarity that then later became BMR. Another, um, and she is one of the founders of an earlier black archives, namely, um, and I have to call her auntie, Auntie Siska Patipiloi, um, who um, still, you can see when she was born, 1926, but she's still very much alive and kicking as an activist. Um, and um, yeah, she was one of the founders of Flamboyant, which was a, a black women's archive uh, at the single, uh, visited by Angela Davis and others like Angela Davis also dropped by in this black archives last uh, year, by the way, who also talked about the term black women as a clearly as a political term, and re which referred to all women with a colonial past, plus women who experience racism and ethnic discrimination in Western society. So, um, and again, someone from the eastern part of the former empire um, um, who, who embraced this notion of, of, uh, of blackness. And of course, we know, uh, we all know, who doesn't know Philomena Esset? Just check the room. Who doesn't? Oh, okay. There's a couple of people who don't know Philomena Esset. Check her out. By the book um, Everyday Racism, she coined the term everyday racism, um, which basically connects the notion of institutional racism and its daily 
utterings and how that's sort of expressed on a, uh, in, 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 in everyday practices. Um, so a pioneer to put the link between gender and race on the map and who also problematized um, in an academic sphere um, yeah, what, what race is all about and basically has been vilified for it by her peers, by journalists, by opinion makers. Um, so yeah, the Netherlands definitely not a happy place for her for dropping the R word. Um, and so she, at, the, at a certain point she also left. Nonetheless, within that community we had writers, um, we had visual artists, there you have, yay! Um, some of them are in the room. Um, <laughs> and, um, but these uh, women of color and black women were also, uh, could also be seen in other spaces. Um, enter Lulu Helder, who knows Lulu Helder? Who, yeah, of course Quincy does. See, and the rest doesn't. This is, oh yes, of course, yeah, of course. People in the back, you know Lulu, right? Tell me you know Lulu or I'm gonna cry. Okay, anyway, so Lulu Helder, um, already in the 90s, very much an anti-Black Pete activist, um, speaking out on it in the Belmer, organizing around it, but also on Dutch television. So, um, Barend and Witteman, you of, you of a certain age or can still remember what Barend and Witteman, I can. Um, and um, she was uh, talking there, uh, yeah, basically stating her case in, in terms of uh, what Black Pete was all about and why she didn't like the figure um, being very clear that the, uh, the party can remain, but the figure needs to go. And there's always this really interesting media um, uh, strategy of finding that one black person who is pro-black Pete, who then is then put up against Lulu. And that's also what happened. But yeah, remember her name, because and she also wrote a book together with Scotty Gravenberg, Sinterklaas, kom maar binnen met zonder knecht. It's a, you can find it in the black archives if you, it's very hard to come by these days, by the way. Right, Mitchell? But also, it was black women's group, Sophie Dela, who started the lobby for a national slavery monument. Who has visited the national slavery monument? Let's see. See, yeah, a lot of, that's not too bad, that's not too bad. Okay, a political lobby started in 1997, um, window of opportunity, parliamentarian in, in, in parliament who said, hey, this is actually a good, a good idea, woman of color, and um, knew the way through uh, to the minister or state secretary, uh, and the rest is history. 2002, it now exists 16 years, uh, which also um, inspired other places to also uh, have um, monuments, Right? Um, okay, well, that was the 20th century. On this trip to the 21st century, we see a first decade where feminism is over. Um, the F word is done. We actually had a minister of emancipation. Um, it was a white guy from a Christian party, but um, <laughs> there you have it. Um, and he said, well, congratulations, the Netherlands. Emancipation is, is done. We can close the door. Netherlands is done. Maybe for a few aloctonous women who still have to learn how to, you know, ride a bike. But what happens is, this is typical Dutch thing, eh, where uh, social movements are being institutionalized. They're very dependent on money, and then it got, gets distract, uh, retracted, and then structures fall down. Uh, which also happened with uh, uh, the Women's Black Archive, for instance. The F word becomes difficult. But in a way, you know, like Shiva, erst something you, has to be destroyed before something new <laughs> rises out of the ashes. Um, enter the second decade, which has become much more, uh, where you see a resurfacing of 
a feminist movement which is much more intersectional and decolonial, and where connections are being rebuilt <coughs> with other forms of struggles. <coughs> and um, what happens then? Oh yeah, well, yes, okay. And then um, what I uh, want to point out is uh, how does it also happen where, where people uh, become invisible again? Or, um, and part of it, I think, is a lack of allies. People weren't talking about it anymore. And people weren't interested in the word intersectionality. Someone like Sis Siska Dresselhuis, I think, is a really good case in point, who's been the editor-in-chief for 10,000 years of feminist magazine Opsai. And uh, so has been a really, really in influential voice publicly on feminism, but basically stated in 2001, I will refuse entrance to editors who wear the veil, for instance. And she stood by that quote um, a couple of months ago uh, at the same time. So not an ally necessarily for black feminists. Um, how about him then? He's been mentioned already, but um, I want to mention him in a different uh, sense because do we remember this, right? Only only decent people, and there's a new book coming out with which is a follow up. Yeah, right. Some people are already, <clears throat> and um, where basically one can say, I. This is what women, especially Anusara Nuzume, uh, was trying to do, basically talk about this notion of, yeah, black women being uh, cast as hypersexual, as aggressive, animalistic. You can see, see the female black protagonist. Uh, tiger sounds uh, are connected to her, for instance, being stupid, being ignorant, etc., etc. Um, and so... Uh, yeah, he, um, uh, yeah, Stefan Sanders uh, basically said, yeah, Jesus, I, there was a time that if you were a man or a woman, it was uh, very normal to, talk, to, to, uh, uh, to call yourself a feminist. I'm from that time. I'm homesick for that time. Uh, but these types of feminists, and he was pointing to Anusha Anuzume for one, uh, for problematizing um, Alain Marnette Mensen. Um, uh, yeah, with those, those types of friends who need enemies, right? And um, there's this link, of course, if we look at the film Alleen maar dat mensen with the historical figure of Sartje Barman, Bartman, again, a woman who spoke Dutch, was uh, partly also in part enslaved by Dutch people, and who was brought to Europe to be put on display in a freak show because of her um, um, different, well, the clear opposite of a white European body type. Uh, after her demise, put on her body parts were put on for maldehyde, put on display in museums. I see some of you nodding. Um, and so there are, you know, connections between this story and that story. Like I said, the continuation of colonial tropes. And again, well, yes, I have to mention her, as you, some of you will know about me, is, um, yeah, Femke Halsema. Um, is she an ally? I think a beautiful um, uh, example of how she's not been an ally is exactly the altercation that she had with uh, Sylvana Simons, who basically asked a question that is important to ask if you're a polit politician. What about et ethnic profiling, right? But this quote already shows a little bit that, yeah, uh, how she looks at this whole notion of uh, issues pertaining to race, exactly the things that black feminists put on the agenda, where she totally individualizes, I think, um, um, uh, ra racism and having a white um, position makes you race, racist off the bat. Eh? Like, okay, instead of looking at it as a system of whiteness and that we're all implicated in that system. Anyway, thankfully though, through people like Mitchell and others, Quincy, people in the room, and this uh, push for um, an anti-Black Pete 
uh, sorry, peat free Netherlands, if you will. Um, people also started to embrace again this notion of, okay, what race, apparently that's important. Uh, should we actually discuss it? Um, and um, um, th and a lot of um, the new generation, I, I will call them, I can do that because I'm old, but um, so they were actually thinking a lot of times, we're the first to actually talk and think about race. And then, oh, wait a minute, <laughs> there were these people 30 years ago. So if you went to study gender studies like Quincy did, then you knew better, but most of you didn't. So, <laughs> but yeah, and then people started to realize, oh, there was such a thing as black feminism earlier. So. People started writing about it. Uh, a breath of fresh air. Black feminism is uh, Nadia Esarwili uh, writing. And Patricia Carson out. She's in the room. She's like, oh my God, I was in the same building and how could I miss those women? And so basically giving this big nod uh, and celebrating uh, some of the women a little bit Amsterdam centric, but okay. Um, no, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> I know, darling. I'm just, I'd have, you know, I'm from Utrecht. I also always have to make this statement about Amsterdam people. Um, and so this is, this, yeah, and this is very celebratory, but also new knowledge production, right? People starting to connect uh, the past with the present, um, with these wonderful books and all, all, of, uh, all of them actually also, I would say, written by feminists uh, and mostly. Uh, uh, women of color. Um, cool thing about Rostat, by the way, was uh, that it was co-published by hip-hop label Top Notch, which I think is also very important to state. So, um, and I'm over my time, I see, but uh, I'm only minutes away from wrapping up. Um, my own two cents for how a slavery museum should look like uh, was about me pointing out uh, these three women uh, to basically also state uh, the connection between gender and race, but also how the Netherlands um, act, was active in at least four continents in the colonial project. And I would like to see that story come to life at some point uh, as well in a slavery museum. And so the backlash has been heavy. Um, the black female intellectual as an oxymoron, case in point. Um, you know, all, you know, all know her, Astrid Roemer. Who hasn't read a book by Astrid Roemer? Have you, you don't dare raise your hand anymore, eh? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, um, you remember she got that prize a couple of years ago, the most prestigious literary prize. And, and so the news daily is like, okay, okay, she's, you know, good stuff. But one of the most important radio shows had three literary critics uh, doing a wrap up of the year and where they said liter literary uh, critic number one. Well, it's politics. They want to give attention to Suriname, the Caribbean, sorry for the literature across borders. They have taken a political decision because who lives there and can actually write? Literary critic number two. It feels like an ideological choice, politically correct thinking. Um, yeah, I know. We can look it up. Case number two, Gloria Wecker, of course. A lot of the people that, of course, she's been celebrated, embraced, but a lot of people who talk about her talk about her being a fake scientist. She cannot actually be a scientist. It's not possible for her to be. Uh, such a position. Even um, the blog Werkgroep Caribische Lettere had, I mean, that was shocking to me, but there you have it. Um, but of course, um, also both Clarice Cargard and um, Saada Norhusen um, having to struggle against, uh, this was only last November, December, uh, one went to the police to report uh, a ton of uh, racist uh, attacks and Seada basically said, yeah, dog, uh, bye, I'm not going to do this anymore. 
Um, and then people were like, oh my God, everyone was writing about it, had an opinion about it. And then Saada herself said, okay, that's all great and dandy. But really what made me stop was that my peers didn't have my back in the editorial room. And that's the problem. We talked about um, uh, infrastructural changes already. That's one of those things that, that needs to be changed, right? Um, yeah, and somebody already said it. I think it was you. Uh, Mama Cash just did a research. Uh, numbers matter, right? Words matter, of course. Um, it's an open museum, but also numbers matter. And so look at these numbers. I mean, yeah, 13% of uh, women being on show in, uh, in museums, it's only 13%. 13 Literature is the highest percentage, 32%, uh, percent, but that's still not near to anything to do with, uh, right? Yeah, yeah, we should, uh, right, even Iris is like, really? Uh, and so I want to end again with Sojourner Truth because um, um, this is a painting that um, Iris herself made specifically for um, a curatorial uh, project. Um, uh, my colleague is in the room. There you are. Uh, to the, the mood team that had just um, Rolando Vasquez is uh, one of my colleagues. Uh, we've done an art exhibition, uh, What is Left Unseen. Patricia is in it as well. Um, where we try to at least uh, um, change that number a little bit because I think it's really, really important. But I also, so it can be very depressing, my story, but I really want to uh, end with, uh, with this beautiful uh, um, picture. Um, to conclude, a long tradition of resistance and a claim to agency, which is a struggle for representation on different levels. I call it a cultural war full of conflict and shift in power balance. And they, these dynamics point to a desire to full citizenship. I think Charles will talk about cultural citizenship tonight uh, by those considered as others, which is, and this is part of why it's become um, invisible and made visible again, this is not a linear process. It's a circular or spiraling process. Black women and women of color have been at the forefront of this intersectional debate and very important, we don't have a proper voc vocabulary yet, um, which we could call colonial aphasia, aphasia, not being able to speak uh, properly on a certain matter. When tackling issues of race, we are making one right now. Thank you very much.